correspondent at Thomson Reuters, Anna Herrera. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Let me start off by introducing our panelists. We have Bill Barheit, the founder and CEO of Abra, Alex Mashinsky, the CEO of Celsius Network, Brent McIntosh, General Counsel at the U.S. Department of the Treasury, and Nouriel Rubini, the chairman of Rubini Macro Associates and a professor of economics at the Stern School of Business. So it's definitely been a very eventful year in the cryptocurrency world. We've seen Bitcoin go up to $20,000 in December. It's now tumbled to half, less than half that. We've seen companies often with very little track record go online, raise hundreds of millions of dollars from strangers, issuing them new cryptocurrencies. So we now have 1,500 different cryptocurrencies out there in the wild. And at the same time, regulators are starting uh, to step in to figure out how to handle this and whether this new asset class is a security or a commodity. So we have plenty to talk about and we have very different opinions on the panel, so I'm sure it's going to be very lively. So I'm going to start off with a very general question. Can you guys help us figure out what happened last year? Is it this the beginning of a new asset class or is this just like the mother of all bubbles? Do you want to start, Bill? Sure. Um, we, we see this all day since Abra is a, a retail investing application for cryptocurrencies. Um, our take is, is that it, the asset class is so nascent, effectively there are almost no sellers right now. Um, the people that I know that are super long crypto are simply not selling. And so if you look at the, the, the order books, right, I mean, it's basically driven by volume of buyers. That's the bottom line. Um, but it's so new, right, that I expect that this kind of volatility is going to happen for um, literally the next five to ten years. And after that, the utility of cryptocurrencies uh, will usurp the speculative nature of cryptocurrencies and then things will start to change. But we need the, liqui the emerging liquidity that, that's happening. We need that now. But effectively, you had uh, institutional money coming in in Japan and Korea in relatively small amounts because it's still a new space. And that created a, a spike which created a bit of a euphoria uh, in the US and in Europe, and then when that euphoria, euphoria died down, obviously the price settled down, but it was still dramatically higher than where it was early last year. Um, but by and large, like I said, the number of people that are holding far outweighs the number of people that are you know, willing to sell at this point. I'm going to go to Alex, and then we're going to move to the no-coiners, as the crypto people call them. <laughs> we have crypto and non-crypto, so it's easy. So you, you sure I'm sit sitting on the right side of the I, I, I don't know. Let's see. <laughs> So we see uh, crypto as just the foot soldiers of the battle between centralization and decentralization. So you have 500 years centralization, which created the largest company we've ever seen. Right? Many of these companies are larger than countries. If you take the bottom 50 countries, Apple or Google are bigger than them in, in their earnings and their GDP and so on. So, so you have this, uh, this situation where uh, the crypto world is just representing that opportunity, representing this new possibilities and enables people to uh, participate. So you have this mass adoption, right, of people, like people are opening, people are trying to open accounts, but they can't, right? If you're looking at uh, a lot of the providers, they're opening, um, they, they're enabling people to open new accounts only a uh, few hours a day because there's so much demand to come in. At the same time, Banks and other institutions are restricting people from coming in by blocking the use of credit cards and so on. All these things are skirmishes over the future of decentralization. So I think that those, uh, anything that goes up must come down, but as more and more people are joining the crypto world, uh, you will see prices continue to go up because the supply is fixed. So anything where you have fixed supply, you have more demand, that we know where that's going. Well, I would... I would uh, dissent a little bit from the thought that we're the no crypto side entirely. <laughs> and from the government's perspective, we're not yes crypto or, or no crypto. The government has an interest in, in uh, where there is a responsible and viable mm -hmm. use case for blockchain or for crypto assets, uh, encouraging American companies to be in the forefront of that um, and, and to bring the dynamism of American technological in innovation to that space. On the other hand, we... Uh, the, the surest way to keep uh, 
to prevent widespread adoption and use of whether it's blockchain or whether it's cryptocurrencies is to have it be a place where investors are not safe, uh, to have it be a place where it's a safe haven for illicit activity. So uh, we're, we're somewhat more tech neutral and um, ambivalent than, than I think <laughs> the characterization. I think no coiners technically mean people that don't own coins, which is what gets thrown at us when we write something that's <laughs> negative. It's, you're, they say you're spreading FUD, which is fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and you're a no coiner. So. Well, the, you know, the, 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 the problem with... <laughs> so you had a little bit of FUD there towards yeah, the end. The, uh, <laughs> the, the problem with owning uh, crypto assets when you're in the government is the conflicts. <laughs> yeah, clearly, like us. Yep. So, Nuria? You well, the, the no coiners are not uh, spreading fad. The coiners are spreading fudge <laughs> because I, I have no interest. I have zero position in any crypto asset, currency, blockchain. Bitcoin can go to a million or can go to zero. I'm not going to make a penny either way. So I'm not talking my books like 99% of the people in this industry. And last night, actually, a friend was telling me this joke and he said, How do you retain uh, an employee that is a crypto billionaire? And the answer is, you wait a month. And that's the answer of exactly what happened this year. Because literally, last fall, I remember, uh, anywhere I was going between Thanksgiving and Christmas, people that don't know anything about finance, they don't even know the difference between stocks and bonds. We're speaking about zero financial literacy. Everybody was coming to me, and before they were saying, hi, Nuriel, they were saying, should I buy Bitcoin? Should I buy Bitcoin? And guess what? Bitcoin went from five to 10,000 and 20,000. And then once people realized this was the mother of all bubbles, much bigger than any bubble in human history, and there are charts on that one, what happened? The suckers who bought the 20,000 lost it all because, you know, it went down all the way down to 6,000, and I was floating around between six and eight, depending on the day and the week. It's highly volatile and so on. So this was a bubble, and like in a typical bubble, uh, the ones who arrived last to the party are the suckers, the retaining investors, and you have a bunch of insiders that sell to the suckers at the peak, and now has collapsed, right? And is now moving sideways for months. So uh, is Bitcoin or any one of these cryptocurrency a currency? It's a misnomer. They're not cryptocurrency. Something to be a money and a currency, if you're an economist, you know, has to have three functions. It has to be a unit of account, it has to be a means of payment, and it has to be a stable store of value. There is no good or service that is priced into Bitcoin, first of all. Uh, it's not a means of payment. And the technological constraint actually is the most important one, whether you're taking Bitcoin, uh, how many transactions per second you can make, given the block size, five. Okay? Visa does 25,000 per second. Okay? Or Ethereum, seven. So there is a massive, massive problem of scalability. And people say, well, there are all these other 1,500 uh, currencies that are going to resolve the problem of scalability. The problem is that uh, Vitalik Buterin, who is actually honest, created Ethereum, says there is an inconsistent trilemma. You cannot have at the same time scalability, security, and decentralization. And the reality is all this talk about decentralization is just bullshit. It's bullshit because all the solutions that have been found so far to the problem of scalability, going from five transactions per second means that Bitcoin is never going to be a means of payment, imply massive concentration risk and centralization and therefore no security. Well, right? I, I that's have to that's, that's to the this. reality. Of it. Yeah, I'm going to give you one final point. I'm going to give you time today, to unpack. The top three Bitcoin miners control 55% of the mining. The top three miner of Ethereum control 61% of the mining. I met the CEO of the biggest mining company in the world, and he says nonchalantly, we control 25% of the mining of Bitcoin and 40% of Ethereum. Once you're at 51, you're going to be having the attacks that can essentially disrupt the entire system, right? That collapses the system. This, the entire industry is becoming a massive concentration and the concentration is increasing. The oligopoly power of the miner is becoming bigger for technical and technological reasons. There is no decentralization. It's just bullshit. So we're going to go back. Can I, can I respond Yeah, yeah, we're going to go back to go into the decentralization. And there will I, never be a solution that is scalable and is decentralized and is secure. All right. It cannot be the case. So, so just, because... Can you tell us how you really feel about okay. it? <laughs> 
Okay, so no, let's, let's you try guys to have take been it. forever just uh, spewing bullshit. So right. somebody has to start all right, saying all right. how okay. things are. So uh, really. can I can I respond to this? Like, I'm sure little, people from the Paul yeah. Ryan thing will yeah, start so flooding in because I, I would. <laughs> you should have come here, guys. L- luckily, I'm old enough to have seen this movie before. So in 1994, I was one of the first guys to. Uh, write VoIP protocols and wrote the original patent for Voice over IP. Voice over IP is the largest decentralized application that exists today. Anyone here paid for the voice calls recently? Back in 94, it used to cost $3 a minute to make a phone call, right? So the internet, this is the largest decentralized application when no one controls any of it, right? The cost is almost zero, yet the companies that provide the service are worth, WhatsApp is, got sold for $20 billion having zero in revenues. So everything Nouriel just said is completely irrelevant through this example, okay? So what we're seeing here... centralized exchanges and centralized I'll let, let, I'll let you speak. Finished. I'll let that's you speak. Yeah. All we're seeing is that we're moving from the VoIP world to the MoIP world. MoIP is money over IP. And Satoshi Nakamoto is the first guy to put together all the necessary technology to enable us to avoid double spend. Meaning if I send you a picture... And I can keep the original, there's nothing wrong with it. But if I send you $20, I cannot keep the original. So digitally, that was very difficult to do. The minute we solved that, then we enabled not just digital currencies, the dollar is a digital currency, but also cryptocurrencies, where anyone on the planet, no matter what the borders are, or what the laws are, can transfer anything to anyone else. Now, if you think about VoIP as a decentralized application where everybody has access to it, it costs nothing, everybody benefits. Okay, no one is losing. Everybody's benefits, the same applies to MoIP. So the banks and the financial institutions just have to adjust to a world where the cost of transaction is zero and companies, decentralized companies like Albert or, or, or Celsius can provide the service for free and are trying to make or create value somewhere else. Can, can you just explain what you mean? Because it might be confusing by saying that your companies are decentralized if you're the CEO and you have staff and so forth. And there's big companies. There's a lot of discussion on companies like Ripple and even Ethereum. They have well, a foundation. Ripple is not a crypto company. So okay. they're, All right. they're so, the only exception. But yes. So maybe just elaborate a bit on this decentralization. I don't even know where dilemma. to start. Okay. I, I mean... <laughs> All right, so... And miners' concentration, because that is a big concern, yeah, let's right? Break it and down. we are moving to so different models. I, I, I've been at this for longer than most. I've been at this for 30 years. I worked on crypto at the CIA. I was a client at Goldman Sachs. I worked on the creation of SSL at Netscape. Started mobile banking services where I work with regulators around the world. And I can tell you with absolute certainty, 100% certainty, that cryptocurrencies are solving problems that can't be solved any other way than with the cryptocurrencies. Um, such so as? Get, such as... Decentralized investing, which we have users in 75 cu- uh, countries that are able to make investments for the first time using Abra application that they couldn't do before. Uh, global money transfer, uh, which now using second layer technologies and smart contracts can scale to visa numbers, okay, using cryptocurrencies in a decentralized model. Consumer asset finance, right? Uh, Foxconn just made an investment in Abra to enable large-scale consumer electronics purchases so that you can make lease payments in emerging markets uh, using this kind of second-layer cryptocurrency technology payment stuff that Abra enables because making the payments cross-border any other way was simply too expensive. These are applications that simply can't be done any other way but crypto. So we can all laugh at BS and all that nonsense, but I'm telling you that six billion people are going to be using crypto. The way they use TCPIP today, the way I liken this is not that, hey, everybody's going to have, oh, I see my Bitcoin, I see my Ripple. It's nonsense, right? You're going to see dollars, rupees, rupees, pesos, and yen, and you're going to be using crypto in the background. How many here use Netflix? You don't even have to raise your hand. I know you all use Netflix. So when you use Netflix, you make a TCP IP connection to a server. Now, I'm willing to bet that most of you have no idea what that means. Now, that's good that you have no idea what that means, because if you had to know what that means to use Netflix, you wouldn't use Netflix. Bitcoin and crypto tech is going to work the same way. You're going to be using crypto Bitcoin technology to move money, make payments, use credits, and with applications like Abra that have hundreds of thousands of users across dozens of countries, and you won't even know it. Right? It's the same evolution in terms of you know, decentralization of information, which was what the internet was meant to do, and now the decentralization of money. And this stuff about mining centralization is utter nonsense. The fact that there are a small number of companies that are making the chips is one thing, because 
Yes, the ASICs that are used to optimize mining have advantages for companies that were early in the space. But the number of people that are buying access But, uh, to these don't pools they control, is enormous. Don't the miners, maybe expl- how many people to, know what miners okay, are? Okay, so, so mining is... Because the, they control the money supply in some types of... They volume. do, but it's not centralized. That's my point. So, so mining is the creation of Bitcoin. Basically, everybody competes every few minutes in the Bitcoin network uh, to solve a simple math problem. Uh, and that math problem gets more complex the more people are trying to solve the problem, which is why Bitcoin gets created at a fixed rate, even if millions of people are trying to solve the math problem. There's certain types of computer chips, ASICs, that have been created specifically to solve this problem. And there are two or three companies that are really good at creating these ASICs. But that doesn't mean that there are two or three companies that control mining. There are two or three companies that make the chips. <laughs> Anybody can mine. And the truth is, is that mining right now is massively decentralized, and there is no way to do a 51% attack on the network without spending hundreds of billions of dollars at this point. Th- that's utterly yeah. false. Uh, there are studies <laughs> suggesting that there is a massive concentration in mining, okay? Well, we, we're and when the head of, state, state, the head okay. of the biggest mining company in the world says, we control 40% of all Ethereum, and the system is such and that our shares are only increased. Only Bitcoin increase because Ethereum. the more you mine, the they larger can say you are. Everybody's one small time. is being essentially phased out. You need data centers with supercomputers that require hundreds yeah. of millions that of dollars. That is irrelevant to cryptocurrencies. There is total currencies. concentration. I mean, it's, 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 it's the de- decentralization is just false. Okay. It's a fact. Let, right? let's, okay. let, let's, let's take a It's not who's producing the chip. Is who are the miners? There is massive and greater concentration day by day. So, so the industry become, just is an illegal. Let, 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 let me let, a let's not get into proof. Let, let me ask a question here to like calm spirits. One second. So, <laughs> it's just, you know. I guess this is our role today. We can agree to that, right? I promise to be calm. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> so, so um, we're talking about this decentralization and money being controlled by miners, and money now is, I guess, controlled by, by governments, right? So it, from, from the government's perspective, and I guess you have insight into what governments around the world um, feel like, can there be total decentralization of money supply? And um, does, this, does, does this make sense now? Yeah, or? well, so if, if people were at the blockchain panel yesterday, we had six experts sitting on stage, all of them deeply involved in the industry, and the consensus was that they had no prediction as to where we were going to end up in 20 years. So where this all goes, I don't know. And I don't think the government knows, and I don't think we, uh, candidly, I don't think uh, anybody here has great certainty on where we're going to end up. That said, one of the things we're concerned about and other governments are concerned around the world about is that there are certain enduring technology-neutral imperatives that we believe, whether you're talking about cash, whether you're talking about traditional electronic payment systems, or whether you're talking about crypto assets, um, need to be uh, validated and, and, and respected. Um, one of those is that we, uh, we oppose and want to choke off flows of illicit financing. So uh, we do not believe that uh, merely because you put crypto in front of the word currency, that uh, money laundering is acceptable or that um, narco-traffic is acceptable or the funding of terrorism is acceptable. Um, We do not believe that merely because an asset is a crypto asset that it is not touched by our sanctions uh, regimes. So, for example, uh, the Venezuelan Petro, we've put out guidance on that. Um, It is subject to our sanctions regimes. The second of those imperatives is investor protection. Because as I, as I said earlier, there's no better way to prevent widespread adoption or use than to make it unsafe for people to invest in these uh, in spaces. So whether it's the SEC or the CFTC or states or other governments uh, with whom we're coordinating through the G20, uh, it, we believe that uh, it is essential and imperative that we... Uh, have investor protection rules, whether it's initial coin offerings or Bitcoin future products on, on, on exchanges or whatnot, we think it's essential that those technology-neutral imperatives apply equally here. Okay. And we agree with all that, I think. When, I don't think anyone on stage here supports anything but what, ju- what we just said. So we're all, we're all on the same page. As I don't doubt as. that. It, it is true, though, that we're the ones who get invited to the Milken Conference. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, but uh, but, but I, can I make a comment on the decentralization? Because the issue is not that... The, the issue is that today, if you, if you want to make a deposit or you want to make a transfer, you have to use a bank. 
those are the centralized institution. It's not about, it's, so there's no alternative, right? right? So you, when you make a deposit with a bank, the bank, you're lucky if they'll pay you 2%. Most, most of you are probably getting less, most of us let, getting less than 1%. Right, and then they take your money. It's not their money; it's your money, and they lend it to the person next to you on their credit card, and they charge 25 percent. So, and that's why, because they're too big to fail. Right, the, the, the monopolies in the banking system have created such an, a, a situation that, because there's no alternative, no one can do anything else. So, part of what the cryptocurrency is an exchange medium, right? It's it's a store of value and exchange medium. Those are the only two things it does, and 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 part of what it does, it says you don't need a bank. All of us, if we agreed to what everybody has in terms of coins, we can exchange value between us, which then could be translated into dollar. So, so this is not about replacing the dollar or competing with the dollar. It's about bypassing the banking system and still being AML, KYC compliant and still not, not doing anything illegal, but creating a, a, an alternate platform. Again, just like VoIP is an alternate platform to the TDM network that became a monopoly. AT&T used to make 90% of its profits from international voice, right? Today, they make zero out of that. So what we're saying is the future looks very different than the past, and in the future, banks are not going to do what they do today. They're going to have to find a different business. So in the future... Excuse me, if, if you invest in crypto assets today, you have to use uh, centralized exchanges. In which sense that's decentralization? That's not Bill, we're Bill, not talking about exchanges. Huh? I mean, you, you can send I mean, money to any in person that, on the planet even without any exchange. Trading. Come on. You can take any coin... And they charge you fees that are as much You as can banks. take any Come coin on. out of those 1,300 coins you mentioned, send it to any person on the planet who has an, IP, an but, address, without any exchange in the middle. But these exchanges at the moment are, I guess... Everybody's yeah. using exchanges. The, the, and look, in which way they are decentralized. The, we, we, we're not, yeah. I, I'm not here to tell you that exchanges are decentralized. That's yeah. not the point. The, uh, they're a form of centralization. Can, you're talking about decentralization. Can, can I, can I, can I, let, no can decentralization. I let's, one second. Let me, really. let me just ask I mean, this. you're so, just making up stuff. So wait, 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 wait. Are exchanges decentralized? But, hold on. What's okay. your you don't know exchanges any have nothing to do with Wait, 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 wait. Why don't you buy so. one coin and then you can tell us how it works? I mean, can, seriously? Okay, so let me ask you this. You're saying... Okay, so you're saying that in the future it it'll be decentralized. And you were talking really? about how banks... Anybody was done. Ho hold on one second, real please. So <laughs> Since 2008... Wait, 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 wait. So in the future, if something goes wrong, who do we sue, right? Because the idea of... I mean, there is... A, banks are concentrated, but also it's because regulation is concentrated on them. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it prevents them from doing anything wrong, as we very well know, but... Like in the future, when stuff goes wrong, and the, and instead of having a bank that manages your money, something else fails. Well, what, in ten what, years since Bitcoin was that? created, not a single Bitcoin wallet, right? The encryption on 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 the on the blockchain that runs the Bitcoin uh, uh, protocol has never been broken. But people the have only, lost the money. The from only way people lost exchanges. money. Exchanges. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The yeah. only yeah. way people exchanges, lost money has nothing to do with cryptocurrency. Yeah. Exactly. They were reckless with their private key, or they put it on some centralized exchange. But anyone who kept their wallet, okay, and kept their key safe, never got nothing. Ever got stolen. Now we know the banks are getting hacked and stolen from every day. Right? Like the exchanges. Like, like, the like the exchanges. They just but little bit. They less. just cover their own losses. And the, the industry is moving from centralized exchanges to decentralized exchanges, yeah. from mining to proof of stake. So this is a young industry, and we have the answers. It's just going to take a few years to get there. But I don't see any problem with scalability. I don't see any problem with security, and I don't see any problem with this becoming a replacement for the financial system. Now, it doesn't replace the dollar. It just replaces how we transact with each other. So, Bill, do you think the people this year that joined the crypto craze or the people that came in in December, November, were, were they coming in because they believe that there is this promise of decentralization or was it, you know, the headlines and promises of instant riches? Are you a bit concerned or, or do you think it's just part of the... Well, so maybe you think everybody's in because they, they understand perfectly <laughs> what this is about because it I, seems pretty complicated. Yeah. I mean, our goal is to actually make it really easy. You know, we have our, we have our average user age is, is in the 50s, which is very different than the exchanges, right? So uh, I, I have a very different perspective on this. Um, exchanges have nothing to do with crypto. Exchanges are SQL databases that you basically store how much Bitcoin you're promised to until you decide to withdraw it to an external wallet. That has nothing to do with cryptocurrency. You can do that with baseball cards, you can do it with posted stamps, you can do it with stocks, you can do it with bonds, okay? Okay, so storing 
uh, crypto keys in a central location is a really bad idea. It has nothing to do with the way crypto was meant to be used. Second, we believe that, as I said earlier, crypto is going to cryptocurrencies are going to enable a whole bunch of other applications. We've just launched the first of these, which is what we call decentralized investing, using smart contracts to give consumers investment exposure to any asset class. That means using our smart contract system, you can invest in stocks and bonds. You can enable a consumer uh, in Ghana to buy an Apple stock where there's no physical delivery of Apple stock. They simply get a smart contract using cryptocurrencies, which gives them investment exposure to that stock. Right? That wasn't possible for small dollar poor farmer investors in remote countries before Abra. So the utility of cryptocurrencies hasn't yet been realized, but the liquidity that the investors bring is absolutely necessary to make these systems work. And institutional investors really haven't even started coming in yet, right? So if you think about what happened in December, and yes, there was, to your question, there was some euphoria around small retail investors who saw a small number of institutional investors in Japan come in. But I know firsthand from all of my meetings that there are a huge number of institutional investors now looking to come into the space. And so if traditional institutional uh, you know, investors start putting one, two, three percent of assets into cryptocurrencies. What do you think is going to happen? I don't know. Let's ask Nouriel. What do you think if institutional investors start coming in and putting money in this? And we've seen exchanges like uh, the CME in, launch futures. And well, in, in my view, they're not going to come. I mean, there is a fintech revolution, and it's completely changing financial services. But it's based on three things: it's based on AI, machine learning, deep learning on one side, big data an internet of things, and it's going to revolutionize payment system, credit allocation, insurance, and asset management. And guess what? As zero, zero to do with blockchain, okay? Goldman today, just wait spent a moment, 300 wait a million dollars today, on today, Circle. Today, payment system. Goldman just spent wait, wait 300 a million today, dollars. Let, let, system, him, let him finish. In, then... in payment system, today, there is Alipay, there is WeChat Pay, there is Venmo, there is PayPal, there is Square, just to name a few things, that are used by billions, billions of people with very low transaction costs and has nothing to do with blockchain. So why aren't these guys essentially going to blockchain? Because that's not the future. There is a revolution that has nothing to do with the blockchain, and that's the fintech revolution. I mean, and that's where payment that systems are before going. Bitcoin that's existed, where they're so. going because your problem of scalability, security, and decentralization cannot be resolved. Right. I'll agree with cannot one thing resolved. with Noriel. And you're, you're, agree, telling Bill, you're telling me, Bill, I'll agree ah, on one thing uh, with centralized you. exchanges were not meant to be, right? The one Say, thing I each agree. of us instead, your utopian anarchic model, each of us on our laptop have our own little wallet, and we have to remember if my grandmother key this long, and if they can hack the centralized, uh, essentially, exchanges that are totally centralized, stealing billions of dollars, how is it to hack my own private laptop or right, tablet? So it takes a second for millions of people. Come on. They you can answer, and then we'll move on. Let's, so, let's do that you have one I mean, rebuttal. I, I, so how about... I, I, I have a bank. Uh, I mean, it sounds like the angry old moment. saddle security. salesman okay, trying to convince us we don't need combustion wait a engines. Moment. I have a bank. Ridiculous. This bank has security, has a reputation, there is deposit insurance, Good. Keep there is less of last resort support Keep of the Fed. Wait, wait, wait. wait, 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 wait the last if there is a default, and every time my bank account or my credit card has been hacked, in a second I'm made whole for the full amount. While when your That's wallet great. is hacked, That's centralized, great. decentralized, you're screwed forever. Right, I'll agree with That's one thing. That's the reality. Come on. I, I so, think one, one, and I'm happy one, to pay it's not a, a small 2% okay. fee for that. Okay, Come on. you so, can have one and then one. we'll move. We'll take so, another call. I agree with one thing. Yeah. 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 I feel like the government may need to on. step in and regulate please, my panel. Please, because I'm, I'm sort of, it goes beyond my purview, I think, at this point. So the one thing I do agree is that we have not yet seen the Netscape moment, right? We haven't sealed the killer app in crypto. So what, what we're, we've seen this Cambrian explosion of innovation, right? Bill, there's more money going into uh, crypto startups than all the venture money all put together, right? So why is that? All these people are stupid? All these in people venture in blockchain, though. No, venture in total. In the last quarter, more money went into crypto than all venture put together. Okay. And the quarter before that, too. Okay. So... So why is so much money flooding into this area? Because it is the next big wave. Now, some people don't believe it. I remember in 95, everybody told me I was crazy and you couldn't, do, you couldn't put voice on the internet. That would be crazy. What are you talking about? I have to dial to get in there, right? 
So, so the issue is, is not about that. The issue is that we don't have a killer app yet. We don't have a killer app that most of the people in the room can press a button and use and say, wow, the experience is so much better. You know, just like we were talking about before, if you had to type a TCP IP address at your header and figure out what, how to make VoIP work, none of you would be making any phone calls, right? Any, anyone here has to type anything? We use WhatsApp or Skype or anything. Anyone here knows how VoIP works? Anyone? Two guys. All right. So, so most of us don't need to know what, how that works to make it work. So we haven't gotten there yet with crypto. I agree with that. But it's coming, right? It took us five to ten years for the internet to kind of figure out what are the killer apps. And then we figured out it was Amazon and Netflix, not porn and uh, 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 travel reservations, right? Because those, those were the killer apps in 95. So, so we are going through that transition. You know, so we, we, we have some guys doing illegal stuff. We're going to shut that down. We have some guys using it for the wrong purposes. We're going to stop that. But as an industry, this is the future, and this is just another asset class. It's not going to be 100% of assets, but it's going to be 5 to 10% of assets. And that's what we're talking about. Okay. Is it zero, or is it 5 to 10%? So while the industry is sort of figuring out stuff and trying to find the killer, killer application, how, how do governments... Protect Before we kill each other. Yeah. Yeah, for, yeah, yes. How do governments protect investors, but at the same time are not too heavy-handed so that they kill all the innovation, right? Because yeah. that's tricky. Because you said the panel yesterday didn't know what was going to happen. So how can you regulate if, you, if the assumption is no one knows yeah, what's going to happen? Yeah, that's a very fair question. And it's really the, the I was going to say the million-dollar question, but I guess it's the million Bitcoin question. <laughs> um, you know, the, stepping back, when we think about how we're going to regulate something, we made a commitment last year that when we're going to think about financial regulation, we're going to do it according to certain core principles. Um, we favor more consumer choice. We think regulation should be properly tailored to their purpose. We will hold not just regulated parties, but the regulators themselves accountable for their actions. And we believe that uh, when we're taking actions to regulate American companies, we should be doing it with an eye toward U.S. companies' global competitiveness. So when you take those things and you look at how that applies here, um, you, you, you have to have, you recognize the interplay between the need for regulatory certainty and the fact that no one is ever pleased with the agility of the government when it comes to regulating, especially fast-moving technologies. So there's got to be a little humbleness on our part um, while having due respect for the, the values I was talking about earlier in terms of choking off illicit finance, investor protection, um, and, and we need to do it in a way that's coordinated with our international partners. Um, and so, uh, and, and coordinated, frankly, across the federal government, uh, because it's, it's all too easy to have kind of balkanization of, of how we handle things. And so, uh, my boss, the, the, the secretary, has, uh, in the context of the Financial Stability Oversight Council, convened a working group of the, the various uh, financial and capital markets regulators to ensure we're talking about uh, the, the rise of uh, crypto assets and, and how we should be monitoring the rise and how we should be reacting. And so you see reactions here and there. You see the, the SEC talking about um, if an ICO has the hallmarks of a security, then it is a security from their perspective. If it meets the, the age-old test that the Supreme Court uh, laid out in 1946 for security, then it is a security. And similarly, the CFTC in, in 2014 said that, um, that cryptocurrencies are commodities, and so if you do a, a, a derivative in a cryptocurrency, that, uh, a futures contract, that you are subject to the jurisdiction of the CFTC. Um, Similarly, uh, as we discussed earlier, if you, if you are um, a wallet or an exchange that touches U.S. jurisdiction, you are subject to our money laundering, KYC rules. Um, so, the, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're taking it in a deliberate and coordinated fashion, both across the federal government and with our partners um, internationally. L let me just ask one follow-up, and then, Nouriel, you can... So, how much act illicit activity happens now? In terms, you mentioned terrorism, and how much of that happens on, on crypto, and isn't, isn't crypto more traceable with the blockchain? How, how good has the government become it, in tracking that? It, it's a fair question. Um, I'm not going to go Indeed. too deeply into <laughs> how good we are at tracking things. I will say that you know, crypto presents, um, it presents challenges and opportunities for tracking, because if you look at the blockchain, it's actually 
perfectly traceable. The problem is you often don't know who's at the end of the chain. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it presents uh, different challenges from, from cash or other electronic transactions, but it also presents different opportunities for us. Noriel. I mean, speaking about uh, securities laws, you know, if I invest into a company, you know, I can buy equity, I'm a shareholder, I can lend money, bonds, or loan, and I know where I am in the pecking order of that capital structure. These guys are totally skirting every securities law. They go out based on a white paper, total vaporware, there's nothing behind it, there's not a good, not a service, not a software. They say, I'm going to do an ICO, and absolutely, you have absolutely no right there's a recent study that says that 81% of all ICOs are already now a scam, a total scam. 61% of them have already gone out of business. And just the other day, uh, the SEC chairman said, if I'm looking at all these different cryptocurrency, the only one that, I looked at that doesn't look like a security is Bitcoin, because the way it was created decentralized. Even the second and third one, Ethereum and Ripple, look like a security, let alone every other one. And guess what? You go on and you do ICOs and you skirt every security law, and that's the world we're in. And at some point, the ECC and the CFTC will have to crack down on these scams, and they've not done it yet. So, so, so you, can you, I respond can, to that? Yeah, please. I'm just going to like segue one second. So, we, so we you, ra you raised money through an, an ICO, <laughs> and, and I know that you, you came after sort of the warnings from, from the SEC. So, and I know that you had to do it a bit differently than the early ICOs. So I guess you, have, you can share your perspective as someone who... Well, so first, I would say that in the first wave of the internet, 95 to 2000, over 95% of the companies went out of business. That's just the normal way things work. That's not like, so saying that 95% of uh, crypto companies are going to go out of business, yes, I agree with that. Because uh, there's a lot of bad ideas in any innovation wave. So we, we have a FinCEN registration, we have a Reg D registration, we're following every law as necessary in the United States, because that's what you have to do. If you're operating here, you have to follow every law. Did you so, raise from US investors? Yes, we, we, we raised $50 million in an ICO, we closed it a month ago. <clears throat> which included only accredited U.S. investors. We did a reg deed re registration, which is what you have to do. We did a FinCEN registration because we touched money that moved overseas and so on. And, and we think, according to our lawyers, we're doing everything legally. Now, I did seven, I'm a founder of seven companies before Celsius, right? Did all of them succeed? No, some of them did great, some of them did not so good, right? So th that's just how, work, that's how the world works, right? So, so here... Yes, I wrote a white paper, and yes, I published it. And yes, the community, 15,000 people downloaded and said, we love what you're doing, here's some money, build it. That's what this is about. This is not about people contributing and saying, oh my God, I'm gonna make 10 times my money. This is like decentralized Buddhism, right? People are saying, well, it is, think about it, right? I'm not talking about the speculators. I'm talking about people from all over the world who called me and said, Alex, are you actually gonna build what you're saying? Are you going to do that? Are you going to give an opportunity to the disadvantaged, to the people who don't have an, a chance, to the people who, who, through our existing banking system, cannot move ahead, cannot join the middle class? And that's what this is trying to solve. This is not just about speculators. The, spe the speculators are like tourists. They come and they leave. Okay? And right now we're seeing a wave of all these tourists leaving. But like we were talking about before, the people that are here for the long term, the people who are here to change humanity, and to save it from itself, are, are here for that reason. And I know there's skeptics and the people who don't believe in anything. And if you look at why the government is so careful about over-regulating this, and I applaud the SEC and the CFTC and everybody else because they are giving everybody an opportunity, is because they see the good side. Yes, there's the bad side, and we all have to control the bad side. We all have to manage that. But if we don't, then it's ours to blame. It's not, we cannot blame anyone else. So, but can I, Listen, Bill, Bill, uh, no. Can I make a point? 95% oh. of startup might be failing, but if I'm a shareholder or a credit holder, I can see some assets. There are some computers, there are some patents, there is an actually very active business of trading, patents of failed ventures and so on, and I have something I have a claim on, and there are security laws, and I have some rights. With ICO, I have zero rights. Yeah. Zero. Zero. That's... Maybe you want to comment on this, or I guess from your perspective, you, you allow trading in some of these tokens that get issued through ICOs. So what, are, what is your perspective on regulation now? You're based in the US, you have some concerns. Are you thinking of delisting some of the coins, adding some? 
No, so we run, uh, as, so the front end for our app is a very simple retail investing application. You know, anybody can use it. Um, but in the background, what we're doing is extremely complex. We track, we, we enable 25 uh, cryptocurrencies for exchanging, buying, selling, and investing in the app today. But we track all of them. We track literally hundreds of them in our market making system because we're actually using uh, Bitcoin smart contracts to give people investment exposure to all these assets. And we're the counterparty to these contracts. And so our market making system tracks literally hundreds of these assets. Um, and, and that has the wonderful side effect is it tells us what's liquid, what the spreads are, uh, how many transactions per day are happening across all of the exchanges in these countries. And it more or less spits out a formula to us to say which of these currencies are suitable for inclusion in the app. Now that's not just a binary thing. We say, okay, great, put it in the app. Once it comes out, and there's probably 50 or so that make the cut today, even though there's 25 that are in the app. Once it comes out the other side, we give it to my chief compliance officer to say, okay, go talk to your contacts at this firm and this firm and this firm and dig in and tell me if there's any reasons why we shouldn't be including this currency in the app. And so far, every currency that we've included in the app not only has gone through that process, but it's been padded with enough kind of uh, tracking on the liquidity side to know that even in the down market we had, it wouldn't become delisted for liquidity reasons or even for you know a change in securities perspective we've gone very deep the, in, if, in if you are if, if these turn out to be deemed securities then you need matter. a reg it doesn't matter wouldn't you need a, a like a license to no we're giving you investment exposure you're holding private keys on your phone with abra we don't hold anything for, on behalf of the consumer uh, just to be clear what this is. And this is also a misnomer about what Bitcoin is. It's not an asset class at the end of the day. It's programmable money. So let me explain what I mean by that. In the Abra app, you're actually getting smart contracts that tie to programmable uh, money. Right? You're, you're holding a private key on your phone that is giving you an investment contract, similar to an ETF, but you're holding the ETF in the case of Abra. We are not holding anything. So we're not a you know we're not managing securities on your behalf. We're not holding securities on your behalf. We're not even brokering. hands decentralized. Well, that's a different different question. But but from a from a securities regulation perspective, and I've gone through this with all of the SEC, CFTC, FinCEN, all of them. Uh, you know we've been very careful about making sure that Abra was architected the way crypto was meant to be used. And let me come back to that point. Crypto is in it, crypto, Bitcoin. Let's talk about Bitcoin specifically. Bitcoin at its core is not an asset class. It is programmable money. So last week I had the honor of spending two and a half hours with the new chairman of the central bank in Mexico, the Banco de Mexico. And he explicitly called me in to say, hey, we're having all these conversations because we don't really understand cryptocurrency. And, we, and, and I, we've been told that you, know, you should help us understand this. So we did a two hour whiteboard session. And the comments that I got at the end of the meeting was, my God, I actually didn't know that Bitcoin could do all of these things. Meaning I didn't know at its core that it was actually software. That when you're actually moving Bitcoin, you're actually executing software, right, via these miners. And that these pieces of software enable what we call smart contracts, which are self-executable programs on the internet, which enable things like the investment contracts that Abra has, which are incredibly complex, but the consumer doesn't see that. They just see that they're holding dollars or Ripple or Bitcoin or Ether or whatever using these smart contracts. But in the future, it can be stocks and bonds and other asset classes. The programmable money enables peer-to-peer -peer money transfer, it enables retail payments at massive visa scale. So once they dug into this, they said, well, this changes everything from our perspective. There are 300,000 investment accounts in all of Mexico Middle class is shut out from investing. Using this technology, we can integrate Bitcoin into the banking system and have the best of both worlds with low-cost retail payments, low-cost cross-border e-commerce, investment exposure into U.S. stocks, which are impossible for the average investor in an ETF model. We had no idea, was the comment I got back, that any of this was possible because everybody's focusing on the damn price, which is nonsense. Right. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you know you you had to f you followed the rules that you thought that your lawyers thought you needed to follow, but that wasn't the case with many of the ICOs, the the really big ones that happened over the past year. You know, some some raised two hundred million dollars from people online. They didn't do any KYC whatsoever. Um, they didn't register anything. So, uh, and you know, as any startup, there's a risk that you say that they might fail. So do you have any concerns, both of you, that there might be just a natural point where all of these companies, the majority of these companies go bust and people are left with nothing well, and that will kind of ruin it for all of you? I, I would be stunned if there weren't either some kind of fines or other actions against people who were early in the ICO space. So be it. 
Okay? People didn't understand what they were doing, and they were doing things they probably shouldn't have been doing. Okay. That doesn't mean that there's a problem with the structure of doing an ICO. You can actually make an ICO function the same way as a security. You can have dividend payments, you can have lockups, you can have certain shareholder rights, all programmed into smart contracts, right? So it's just that we chose not to do that in the first iteration of these smart contracts because, you know, it was quick and easy. That doesn't I mean, mean that yeah. that's the way it should be done. Yeah, we, we, we didn't shut down TCP IP and HTTP because a bunch of companies went bankrupt in 96. Or because the internet was used for porn and gambling in the mid-90s. Exactly. So, so we, look, we, we followed KYC rules. We, we KYC'd every person that uh, wanted to contribute to our part from all over the world, not just from the US. Right, and there's a lot of uh, the SEC supposedly issued like 80 letters to companies that didn't do any of that. So, and and a lot of it is, hey, you you didn't follow the rules, go and do it. They didn't say, hey, shut down, give all the money back to your investors the way China did. That, that's what China did. They said no ICOs, give all your money back, and they went to the bank and said, if you touch any crypto money or do any crypto transaction, you lose your license. Right. So, I think we're a much more progressive country that that enables and knows how to balance innovation and uh, risk management, right? So, so the opportunity here is too big for us not to participate, right? I mean, you're seeing countries all over the world passing specialized regulation to invite all these companies to be domiciled in Malta and, and Singapore and, and Gibraltar and, and Estonia and so on and so on. Uh, you know, they just announced, uh, you know, the Bahamas just announced the deal and so on. So we don't want all that capital and all those opportunities uh, leaving the United States and moving to any of those countries. So I think... Finding the balance is not easy, but I think you know, the, the, the killer apps, the great applications, the good entrepreneurs are going to separate themselves from all the bad ideas. And there's a lot of bad ideas. I, I get asked every day to be an advisor or participate or invest in projects, and I say no because a lot of these are bad ideas. You know? and w would you give uh, 5 or $10 million to a 20-year-old? That's what we're doing every day in this world. So, so most projects are three 20-year-olds from Russia who have a new crypto uh, protocol or have a new uh, app or whatever, and most of those are going to fail. So we're not talking about those. We're talking about, is TCPIP here to stay? That's really the question. It obviously sounds like a ridiculously mute question in the internet world, but that's what we're asking. What we're asking is, is Bitcoin and Ethereum, which represent a certain type of cryptography, right, and a certain type of rails on which many things could be built, are they good or bad for society? That's really what we're talking about. Let me ask one more question on, on this side, and then we're going to open up. But, so let's separate blockchain, the technology, one second from the cryptocurrency. So for the government, do you, does it have the potential to sort of streamline some of your operations or even taking it to the extreme and bringing back the crypto? Could we see like a crypto dollar, like a digital form of... Well, I think those are <laughs> two, two very two, different two, questions two that different I tried questions. to cram in. I, I think uh, as to the the use of blockchain, again, back to yesterday's panel, where we end up in terms of what the the real viable, responsible use case for blockchain is, I think is is up in the air. Um, and it's very possible that there will be uh, applications uh, that will be very useful to the government. You you hear people talking about them periodically in terms of property ownership or uh, yesterday's panels were talking about voting. Um, so is it possible? It's certainly possible. Uh, that's a kind of stay tuned message. Um, as to the digital dollar, I think uh, you know I would associate myself with the, the comments that Bill Dudley from the New York Fed made, which were that it was wildly premature to be talking about that at this point. Nuriel, do you concede that there is some possible use case for distributed ledgers or blockchain or no? Uh, in wait. any in any kind of use case, be it <coughs> identity, supply chains, or well, first of all, I would separate uh, blockchain as a technology from cryptocurrencies and crypto assets and ICO. Secondly, in my view, even blockchain is a bit of an overhype uh, technology because, as I said, uh, the fintech revolution right now, and there are thousands of firms who have actually a plan, revenue, profit, and so on, have nothing to do with blockchain. Um, I don't think that we ever need and we can have a public decentralized uh, 
blockchain because the scale of stuff that you have to store in a public way doesn't make sense. It's going to lead to centralization. There's no way that all that decentralized stuff can be held in small computer. It just doesn't work. And, you know, the users are going to be users that are going to be with private or semi-private blockchains. And what's the difference between a semi-private blockchain or a private blockchain and a glorified uh, Excel spreadsheet? It's just variant of the same. You know, many corporations have lots of internal activities and I don't want to have all my transactions on a public ledger. Why would I want it and who cares about that and what's then a private blockchain is just a, another fancy database uh, of one sort or another but it's not a decentralized world in which everything is done in a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized anarchic way and even those applications so far we have not we have not seen them you know the only application of blockchain so far has been you know bitcoin and bitcoin is not scalable and ethereum is not scalable that's why you have the forks that you have that's why you have 1500 other attempts to try scalability. And so far, every solution that is scalable leads to concentration and centralization, and it's not secure. And that's why there is an inconsistent trilemma. You cannot have, at the same time, security, scalability, and decentralization. That's what in our, it is. In our world That's of secure, institutions, scalable, of trust and, and decentralized. All right. Let, let's, it doesn't exist. Let's open it's up. Just, you know, you, yeah, here. How many more examples should I bring? Wait, let, let's... Let's have a question. You, Hi. you state something. Okay. Hi. I would appreciate if, uh, I'm going to give a long-winded uh, question, but I would appreciate not being um, interrupted. Um, <laughs> so uh, I respect Good luck. everything. I uh, respect everything that you've done. I'm the co-founder of Akamai Technologies. I have invested in more than 70 uh, early stage companies over the years, including Google, Seagate, and some other ones you would know. And I hear you talking, most of the people in this room don't know how to invest in cryptocurrencies. They're here to learn more. They read the negative bylines about the theft and the money laundering and the drug dealing. We solve the problem similar to your speed of the network problem with our company. Back in the day, you couldn't surf a lot of web traffic without the sites going down. And there are many, many new platforms now developing technologies to solve the problems that you um, talk about today, but that's part of the um, evolution of being an entrepreneur and creating these new exciting uh, companies. As a reminder to most people in the room, uh, most people who are not in the technology world back in the day doubted the fact people would give their credit card to buy books, let alone cars online. And uh, all the doubters in this room today um, should recognize that um, Real companies are going to be created on the blockchain for the future. This is here for the rest of our lives. Uh, the topic of this conversation itself is the irrational exuberance of cryptocurrencies. And having lived through the dot-com meltdown, our company decreased 99.8% of our market value. It was way overvalued, as a, lot of those crypto, as a lot of these crypto companies are today. And most of these crypto uh, uh, currency companies, I agree with um, Alex, who I've known for a very long time, are going to have a very large rise and fall, but there are some real technologies built on the blockchain. And to your point, um, every major venture firm, those including Andreessen and other companies that have funded Netscape and Google, are all pouring billions of dollars into this uh, market to solve some very real problems, especially in a lot of the third world countries where um, devaluation of their uh, currencies is a major problem, and this solves that problem. No one has uh, talked about that problem. Um, I'm so, going to have to get you so to go my, to the uh, question. So my question to Brent is, uh, uh, we're all waiting for more regulation to solve a lot of these problems. Uh, most companies are raising, um, are, are trying to comply with legal regulations as utility tokens. I also have a legal background. Uh, I don't think that works. Most lawyers think that works. When is the government going to say, these tokens are not utility tokens, they're uh, securities, which will bring some massive uh, uh, stability to a market that greatly needs it. You know, that's fundamentally, it's a question for the SEC. <laughs> but and they have. Chair Chairman Clayton has stated that when he looks at all the ICOs, he's seen, yeah. he hasn't seen one that he thinks is not a security. They, they have said this. They've been very, he, he, yeah, but they're never going to do that because they're going to want to have the flexibility to decide who to find, who not to find. It's just not going to happen. So I think everybody needs to accept that they're securities and move on. To, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And right now, all you have to do is not be the nail sticking out. 
Yeah. And there are lots of nails sticking yeah. out, I think, from the previous I'm not talking about mail, I'm talking about nail. Yeah, that's what it is, yeah. No, no yeah. just checking. Just, that was a joke. <laughs> All right, uh, any more questions? Yeah, there's... W one here at the front. Yeah. One here... Oh, the mic is... Sorry. There... She, that, can we have the one at the back, right at the back? She's standing up and then... Yeah, yeah, sorry. Can. So just to expand on that, will the SEC, though, because we know they've been very clear, will they legitimize certain infrastructure players so that we know how security tokens will come to market? You'll have to ask the SEC. I mean, <laughs> they're, they're an independent commission. Okay, well, so, so one I think here. Just, I can answer that. The... the the problem is that the, the, the line between what's a security and what's not a security has not been really tested since the Howey test in the Supreme Court or in any major uh, test. And, and uh, the industry has moved dramatically since, right? I mean, we've developed a uh, hundred different things. So what needs to happen is that the courts have to... This is not an SEC decision, in my view. There are some cases in the courts that are... Right, but they have to be decided. So, so, uh, and, and if it's decided in, in local court or federal court, that's not going to be enough. I think the Supreme Court needs to decide... Uh, if we are living in a new world and, and that society needs these things which are not securities or not. So, so until that is tested, and not just in the United States, until it's tested in Japan, until it's tested in other countries, we're not, we're not going to really know. And you know, I, 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 th I think Randy said very well what, what the issue is. Now the question is just a, how long it's going to take to get there. For, for the SEC, they want to control their domain and I understand that, but if you listen to the testimony of the CFTC, where the commissioner very clearly said, it's not our decision. If our children want this, then it's our obligation as the government representing our people is to do what our kids want, not to block it. So, so I, I side with the CFTC. I think it's a much more progressive way of thinking about it. And the SEC has to just uh, be instructed. It's not about them. Uh, they, they follow the law, right? So whatever the law is, they're just going to execute that law. Right. That's a question here. Um, one of the translations of decentralization is censorship resistance. And the people who talk about blockchains and this stuff think in terms of these are censorship resistant, which also means resistant to government regulation. The technology is in some sense fundamentally designed to be censorship resistant, resistant to government regulation. Right now we're in an in-between state, but game on, how are you going to regulate it when the technology really gets decentralized and is working? Well, I mean, again, we, we don't know where this is all going to end up. This is, there's a, uh, is the, the future is immensely uncertain here. And we, just as the technology will evolve, our approach will evolve. I mean, the, to predict where we're going to be in 10 years or 20 years would be folly. Do we have any? Yeah, we have one there. So I started a small college and I had some students ask me, if I'm accepting cryptocurrency. Is that something that's gonna happen soon? Should I start accepting cryptocurrency as payment? <laughs> well, uh, He's so gonna shill his coin now. He's gonna say, you should have started accepting mine. Or no. So obviously these things are very volatile and, and if you need that capital to run your business, to run your college, then you're taking a lot of risk, right? So it's too much risk for you to take to run your business in a normal way. But a lot of, what a lot of companies do is they, they for, uh, for example, Overstock and others, uh, they accept crypto for only 10% or 5% of their payments, and then they use that almost as an investment vehicle where if it appreciates, it could be become hopefully the endowment for a college, right? Because it has a chance to appreciate a lot, but it also has a chance to go down in value. So, so it's all about how much of that you're allocating. If it's only 5 or 10% of your total con uh, college contribution, you know, the, the, the fees, then I think it's reasonable. Any more? One here? So, Wait for the mic. So um, when Alexander Hamilton founded the American financial system, he had to deal with 800 different banks all creating their own currencies. And he was dealing with the big problem that blockchain actually solves uh, or should solve, which is how to track who actually owns these bonds or stocks or dollars and what they're worth. So I, I have no problem with the technology, but it seems like all of the um, currencies right now are, seem like very AOL because they actually may solve one problem, but they don't solve a big problem that we've learned from history, which is um, the currency has to be able to expand enough 
to meet the uses of the people who need it. And blockchain, uh, Bitcoin, for all I understand, is severely limited. And so the more the value, the cost of it goes up, the less utility it will have. So, so let, me, let me address... We have one, yeah. one minute and 38 seconds. There's a whole bunch of, um, I think, potential kind of misunderstandings that the market has that are related to your question. So first of all, um, there's no central governance in Bitcoin, right? That's actually a feature because that actually helps maintain the immutability uh, and the security, which are the most important features of it, me meaning that no benevolent dictator can actually say, change the code so that a 51% attack is possible to erase all the prior transactions. It's not possible, okay? I've tried to actually act on the side of people making changes faster and I've lost the battle, okay? So, so the decentralized governance is while it's a feature, it has the downside that it causes the changes to happen very slowly, which when you have a $200 billion asset class is probably a good thing. It turns out that the best way to deal with that is lots of competition. So lots of cryptocurrencies are emerging which solve different aspects of the future technology stack around Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin itself has an amazing roadmap. I'm a huge believer in it. Um, the Lightning Network, which is, in, which is actually in production now, which can scale to hundreds of thousands of transactions a second, meaning visa-like numbers, is now live, okay, using smart contracts. Um, but ultimately, other technologies from other cryptocurrencies, which may fail, like the snarks or the, the privacy aspects of Monero or Zcash, will probably find their way into Bitcoin at some point, and it, but it may take 10 years. So the best way to deal with all of this is these competing currencies. So it's a very different problem than trying to aggregate you know, everything into a central bank, which is the opposite of what we're trying okay, to do the, here. The, right. <laughs> okay, all right, so please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.